So my first question was just around the main aims of the study. You know, what was, what is the questions that you want answered from that? Yeah, well, uh, so the observation begins with um, something we've known for close to 30 years now, uh, and that is that uh, eating disorders, and anorexia in particular, but also bulimia uh, and, um, and binge eating, which are our main, main focus, um, are, um, uh, ha have a strong genetic component. And we know this from doing twin studies. Mm. These are studies we did here in, in Australia, right here in Brisbane, actually, um, and um, and elsewhere in the world, comparing identical and non-identical twins, yeah. showing that identical twins are much more similar in their eating behaviour, their eating disorder behaviour, than non-identicals, uh, from which we can estimate that about they're about 60% genetically influenced. So that's where the subject sort of rested for 20, 25 years until this new technique came along called genome-wide association study, which actually offers the ability to uh, identify the particular genes involved. Yeah. And we think it's very important to do that because by identifying those genes, uh, it may offer uh, new pharmaceutical leads on how to mm. uh, treat these conditions. It also, using um, some quite clever statistical technique, it means you can actually build up what's called a polygenic risk score that enables you to predict a person's risk of having uh, one of these disorders. And we think that that's going to be quite useful in the clinical setting. I mean, if you could do that prospectively, I think eventually everyone's going to have this done at birth, quite frankly. And yeah. if you know that somebody's at, at, at high risk, then you can take preventive action uh, be, be, you know, before things go too far. Mm. But I mean, I should I emphasize that both of these are sort of research aims. These are a long time, yeah. uh, a long way from delivery in the clinic, but uh, you've got to start somewhere and that's what we're trying to do. That's great. And I know from reading some of the, the, the preliminary studies that came out and there was a bit of a conversation around genetics and then the environment and how are the two impact and, and yes. are they, they're not mutually exclusive, but what are your thoughts no. on that? Yes, well, that, that's, that's, as I said, that's sort of uh, really where we began. Mm. Um, I've spent the first half of my career at least uh, on, on twin studies, mm, mm. Uh, not because we're interested in twins per se, but because uh, the comparison of identical and not identical twins uh, yeah. uh, is, is the best design that we have. It's a sort of natural experiment that we have to estimate the relative importance of genes and environment. Um, because uh, identical twins share all their genes in common, so any different any differences between them must be due to environmental factors, whereas non-identical twins share only half their genes in common. The two types of twins are brought up, are brought up in very similar circumstances, mm -hmm. so we can then make the inference that the excess difference of non-identical twins from identical twins must be due, due to genetic factors. Mm. So, so that's what enables us to estimate that about 60% of the differences between people uh, um, in, with respect to anorexia, but similarly for bulimia, binge eating, yeah. uh, about 60% of those are due to genetic factors. In other words, genetic factors are very important. And, yeah. and this... Um, this, con uh, this sort of compares with um, uh, uh, with uh, schizophrenia, which is about 80%, yes. and depression, which is about 40%, 37%. So, uh, and it's about the same as bipolar. So mm. it's, it's, it's a sort of fairly seriously uh, influenced by genetic factors. Mm. Um, so that that's, as I said, that's where the subject sat for about 25 years because mm. we did those twin studies back in the 80s, 90s. Uh, and it's only this recent technical breakthrough uh, with these gene chips uh, that has enabled us to move to the next stage of asking patients and controls for DNA, uh, which we can get just from a spit sample, by the way. Um, and then we can type them on these chips, which for these studies to work, you need huge numbers. Mm. And so even though we, 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 we do a pretty good job in Australia and we contributed 3,000 yes. anorexia patients already to the last 
uh, international effort actually is around 16% of the, of the world total. Um, uh, the fact is that we need very much larger samples. I mean, for example, for depression, yeah. which is another phenotype I work on, we're up to about a quarter of a million cases uh, and, and uh, nearly a million controls. Um, so uh, in the first paper we did on anorexia, we had about 17,000 cases. Yeah, and that was great. That was certainly good... you know, the best. That, that sounds huge, but I mean, believe me, no, ideally we'd have, we'd have, a, have, a hundred, have 170,000 cases. That's what, that's what we'd yeah. really like to get. So, so this new project is, is towards that end. We, need, we know that there are lots you of need... cases out there in mm. Australia. We know that Australian uh, patients tend to be extremely um, well disposed to research and very cooperative. Yes. Um, we've always found them uh, to be absolutely super to work with. So we're calling on, on them again to take part in the study, which is okay. really not asking much of people. Um, we, we asked them to go to our, our website uh, okay. and fill out a fairly short questionnaire um, and then uh, to be willing to give us a saliva sample um, and we send them the tubes and uh, all they have to do is spit in the tube, put it in the self-addressed envelope uh, and um, put it back in the mail. Yeah. It doesn't cost them a cent. It takes them about five minutes of their time to spit in the tube. So it's not really a very big uh, ask. It's not onerous, yeah. Not onerous. Well, we, it mm. used to be we had to ask people to give us a blood sample. Uh, and, and, you know, people were not very keen on that for various reasons. Firstly, it's yeah. not very pleasant. And secondly, it's, um, you know, it's a bit of a fag to actually get to a pathology clinic and yeah. do all that. In fact, that's what, how we did the first anorexia study. We still got 3,000 patients, I should say, which was fantastic. But now we can, well, the technology's improved to the point where we can get DNA from spit that's um, just, it's, 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 it's not quite as good as blood, but it's good enough. Um, and so uh, we've moved our whole operation over to that. It's much more acceptable to patients. And it's, uh, and it's much uh, cheaper and uh, yes. uh, more hassle-free. And I think that is a role we as a community organisation can definitely play in, in encouraging our existing clients who, who are engaging, you know, engaging with us as a community. That's a really important play place for us to be as a community to support this research. Well, that's great. I mean, yeah. we would be extremely grateful because, you know, if we want to improve uh, the, the treatment of these conditions, um, okay, you know, yeah. we need to improve the research. I and mean, I always say, you know, if your car's broke, uh, the first, the best way to fix it is first of all to find out exactly what's wrong. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what we try. That's what we try yeah. to do. You know, I mean, we, we can talk in very general terms about what's wrong, but we need to know in exact terms. You know, yeah. this gas is blown, or this this yes, piston ring yeah. broken, or whatever um, is the equivalent. And and that's what we need to be able to do. And only when we've got that exact information can we really start to address it. Uh, and we've no. actually seen that happening with all the studies around schizophrenia and the knowledge <coughs> and the preventative and the medication. So it, it, it made people's life significantly better. So, and we really hope that that would have the same impact for our clients with eating disorders. Exactly. Well, schizophrenia, of course, is, is the most serious mm. um, uh, sort of, uh, mental uh, illness and uh, both in terms of the severe impact on the patient and in terms of the health dollars to the community. The yeah. And therefore, it's, it's had proportionately more investment. And, and it yeah. is further down the track, and we're now up to huge sample, I don't know, 60 or 70,000 patients for schizophrenia, and we've got over 200 genes, and some of those mm. look like being very good drug leads, leads mm. for new drugs and treatments, and that's the position we want to be with in anorexia. I mean, we're starting about 10 years behind schizophrenia, but we believe the time is right to actually go down that path. I think another point I'd like to emphasize, this is, I'm talking about the sort of direct sort of medical clinical benefits yes. of this, but I mean, I think another point that's come out from our earlier studies is how empowering patients find actually taking part in these sorts of studies and realizing you know, that potentially mm. we can do something about this. 
you know, there's this sort of very logical, positive uh, attitude. And, and, and also, I think that particularly, well, mental uh, conditions in general, but, but particularly, I think, with eating, eating disorders, there's a tendency for people to blame themselves. And Correct. for, par- for parents, parents to blame for parents in particular to blame, oh, where did we go wrong? You know, mm. what did we do? What did we do wrong? And you know, Julie's upbringing, what can we, you know, blah blah blah. Um, and I think actually understanding that uh, this is largely driven by genes, I think, is is, is sort of really quite um, enlightening for many people and alleviates guilt and, you know, I think makes people just concentrate in a much more positive way about about the condition. You know, I mean, I yeah. always say. I mean, people say, oh, you know, genetic conditions, that means you can't do anything about it. Do so, anything look, about it. <laughs> I, I said, look, short sight is completely genetic. What do you do? You wear glasses. You know, being, <laughs> being, being of short stature, yeah. you know, it's totally genetic. What do you do? You wear high heels. <laughs> uh, I mean, all, you know, you don't like your hair colour, which is totally genetic. You go and get some hair dye, change yeah. your hair colour. I mean, you know, so, I mean, I know there's, in a sense, sort of slightly trivial examples. But I mean, they sort of counter this point of view that just because something's genetic Maybe, means it yeah. doesn't mean you can't do anything about it. It doesn't le- it doesn't render you powerless. It actually, like you were saying, it's going under the hood of the car and say, there's yeah. something in, about the mechanics, but we can we're hoping to do something about it. If that drug has already gone through the whole process of FDA yeah. approval mm. and all the safety and so on, then you're shortcutting about at least ten years' work yeah. and about a billion dollars worth of investment. So that's that's probably the best single outcome. So, uh, but those are the pharmaceutical approaches. Uh, but as I said, the the other thing that's uh, come out of this sort of work, uh, called GWAS work, general general wide association yes. scale work, is is the polygenic risk score, which says, well, let's not just focus on this genetic variant or that genetic variant. Let's just add them all up, and that that gives you a total score. It's called a polygenic risk score that more or less tells you what your risk is relative to, to baseline mm. of getting that disease. And um, I mean, it does, it depend, depending upon the disease, it, it may not account for a lot of the variation, but it could still be clinically useful to actually tell someone, well, actually you're in the top 10% or 5% of risk in the population for getting this condition. And, it, you know, you may, it may be useful for you to know that, and if you find yourself starting to develop odd attitudes towards food and eating Absolutely, and so on, re- yeah. re- recognize that you're at risk of this. You don't want to go down that path and you need to take these specific steps like counseling yeah. or whatever. Mm. Yeah. 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 And, 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 and I, I think that could really be useful. Yes. It's sort of similar to maybe people with a substance use um, issue and the genetics related to people who are prone to addiction like well, exactly know, yeah. yeah yeah i mean so i mean at the moment you know the, the, there's uh, children of alcoholics can go either one way or the other they can become alcoholics themselves or very often they become teetotal because they don't ever want to be exposed to the condition and, yes. and you know, that sort of rational behavior is probably quite good but but i mean a more scientific approach to that would be able to give them a genetic test um, and say um, and say and be able to tell kids well actually yes you do have those same genes and so yeah you know never have alcohol yeah you might be able to say to others actually you know you're lucky you you don't have that genetic predisposition so you can actually afford to drink socially uh, like anyone else mm. you know so, and so I mean, it's taking that harmonization approach Exactly, but a, but in a more nuanced way that actually, yes. Uh, yes. That, 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 I mean, it, it's actually, it's what's called, what, what everyone's aiming for now, you know, the buzz phrase is personalised medicine. And so, I mean, in okay. the past, the whole philosophy is just one size fits all. Everyone gets the same treatment. It's common knowledge that it works for some people, but not for others. Nobody has a clue why. Doctors don't have a clue why. It's just hit and miss. And there's a huge inefficiency in our health system. Uh, by doing that, you know, huge amounts of uh, firstly personal uh, angst uh, of the patients, you know, who are given this treatment and find it doesn't work. Secondly, huge waste of public health dollars mm. uh, in, in prescribing treatments that we never had a chance of working anyway. Imagine if we could actually, before we do any prescribing, give a DNA test. 
which is going to get cheaper and cheaper, by the way, yes. and say, well, actually, this drug uh, is not for you, but this one is. You know, yeah. this is the one you want to be taking. So that's that's where we want to be in 10 or 20 years' time. And I know there was also um, a conversation around traits, so the, the trait, especially with somebody with anorexia nervosa, around the perfectionism and how yes. that ties in with um, genetics. Did you want to have a conversation? I know that yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the really interesting features of, yeah. uh, of this. And one of the interesting outcomes of that paper that I do believe very strongly is that uh, uh, as a byproduct of um, getting these polygenic risk scores, in fact, you can get those for other diseases yes. and conditions, and then you can simply correlate those between those conditions to get what's called a genetic correlation. And when you do that, by far the highest correlation is with uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. Yes. Yeah, yeah. There's a genetic correlation of about 0.5. Yeah. Uh, that's actually a condition that we're we're also working on, so that, that adds another dimension to it. But you know, th that's part of what makes this so scientifically fascinating to me. I mean, how it isn't brilliant, how yeah. Yeah, ties in with these other conditions. Yeah. We yeah. really want to encourage our client cohort, and we've got yeah. obviously we spend a lot of hours with a lot of clients, yeah. and yeah, and I think this will be really helpful for, for both the client. And for us, and we actually had really beautiful response back from our carers, particularly around this research, because we wrote a little blog on it, and mm. a lot of the carers came back saying, "Wow, there's some relief in this. I wasn't the person who caused it." Mm. Well, exactly, exactly, mm. and I think there's a there's general. I don't know how good the research is, but I mean, I've heard over and over again. You know, if, if you want to, if you've got a disease, you want to do something about it, join a trial, join a study. Because yes. just the mere fact that you're taking part in that, in a sense, is empowering. And also in reading, you know, doing the survey, it to, you know, informs you more about your own condition and how it Correct. relates to that and others and so on. But it was wonderful meeting you. Thank you so much. Good. Have a great day. Thank you. And Talk you too. Soon. Thank you.